our brother Wayne Jones. Uh, he's, he's here with his family, his wife, Shanna Kay, uh, and two of his four daughters, Bailey and Carson, have been here. Wayne is an instructor of, uh, he's an instructor of Bible at Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver, and uh, I'm fortunate to have him as a family friend, but also as a brother in Christ who is so talented at being a messenger of God. Wayne, come preach the word. Thank you. Thought I might cry tonight. It's kind of my habit sometimes. Um, then Colton introducing me, that was uh, it's pretty special stuff. Uh, I love and appreciate the Stewart family. You, you guys know that. I hope you do. Um, I usually try to say this is Charlotte's favorite time of the year, time that we kick her out of her bedroom, and she doesn't have to uh, spend the night there, and um, she... Uh, gets to really roam around the house most of the time, but then we brought our dog this time, so it might actually be Charlotte's favorite time of the year. I was going to start tonight, too, by asking for your help. Um, I have a dilemma, and, and you guys have supported us through the years and helped us, and so I want to get your, your take on this. Is it okay tonight when we get to Hannah and Chance about 1 o'clock in the morning to wake our grandchildren up? Is that okay if I get your approval, I haven't got a yes yet. I'll, I'll, I'll get confirmation later, all right? Um, thank, thank you for an awesome week. Um, I really mean this. Uh, this week is a highlight, uh, probably one of the top three weeks uh, of our, our whole year um, to be here and to be a part of of these lessons, to sit at the feet of these great men. Um, I, I'm indebted to Robert for uh, his enthusiasm and, and, and a very difficult subject, but also the practicality in bringing that to life for us. Um, and uh, today, the conversation we had, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, and I hope that, that, uh, that you were able to suffer through that with us um, in, our, in our 1030 session together. Um, to this congregation, I, I know that, and we're going to have HOM 1 guys next, next quarter, and I'm going to break all those rules uh, right now. And when you get up, preach, all right? Just remember that. But um, the support that you guys give us. Emotionally and financially and prayerfully to do the work we do at Bear Valley means the world to me. Um, I kind of, kind of hinted at it this morning in our, in our discussion. Um, I don't know that, that two or three years ago I had enough faith to, to say, okay, we're going to move to Denver and I'm going to ask people to give me money to do that. Um, but uh, many of you may not know, we, we almost went one time before and there were two congregations that had already said, when you go, we're helping. And West Hill was one of those that said that. And so I, I kind of thought that you might help the second time around. Um, but the, uh, the, the trust that you have in us is, is humbling. Um, I'm not sure that I, my heart's made for this long term <laughs> to have to go and say thank you, but thank you. And uh, I know it's not about me tonight, and it's not about you tonight. It's about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and what he's provided for us. But because of him, we have a connection and a bond uh, that will last all the way through eternity, and I'm so thankful for that. You know, if we don't get uh, another lectureship together, I'm going to borrow a line from a good friend of mine, and I don't know that this is how eternity is going to work, but maybe once every thousand years, God will let us, let us have West Hill lectures in heaven. Um, and even if that's, that's, that's what he does, that's enough for me, and I'll be happy uh, because of it. Um, I want to share with you a story tonight as we begin. It's true. It's one of the dark days in our nation's history. Um, in fact, we've had a lot of those. If you look at the atrocities that have been committed on our soil and the, the, uh, the, the tragedies that have taken place and our citizens who have fallen and, uh, and the treatment of certain segments of our population at the hands of certain segments of, of our population. But on November the 29th, 1864, uh, there was what became known as the Sand Creek Massacre. It took place uh, outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, there had been some tension leading up to this point, and as you might have guessed, it had to do with those that in, the, in the 1850s that were head, heading west uh, for gold and for silver. And the Colorado Mountains became a, a, a mining 
uh, opportunity. And so as white settlers moved in to mine for gold and silver, Native Americans were pushed out of their land uh, to settle in other places. And as you might imagine, there was great tension that was brought as a result of those things, that, that tension and the, and the attacks that took place in the mining camps and the, and the wagon trains and, and uh, the, 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 the stagecoach lines ended up resulting in the, the War of Colorado from 1863 to 1865. And in that uh, time frame, the uh, governor of the area, John Evans, who Mount Evans is actually named after, commissioned a uh, Civil War general to come to Colorado, John Shivington, and to stop the Native American aggression against what he considered to be his people. He issued two decrees, one that all friendly Native Americans be found and, 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 and encouraged to continue that, and then all that were aggressive were to be threatened and warned um, with, with military force if they didn't shape up. And, uh, and get in line and, 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 and do what the uh, governor of the area wanted them to do. And as the Civil War was raging in the East, this war was going on between the uh, militias in, in the Colorado Mountains and the Native Americans. And in September of 1864, there were peace talks that were held. And there was a determination that was made that there would be certain segments of the mountains that would be, would be allowed for the, for the Native Americans to rest and to be at peace. And if ever uh, soldiers came through, all you had to do was wave your, your flag of peace and there would, there would be uh, a truce that would be found. And there would be no killing and no wars and no fighting. It wasn't long after. In fact, some suggest it was the same day that those peace talks were made and nothing formal was signed that Shivington's Superior Officer General Samuel Curtis sent this message. I want no peace until the Indians suffer more. No peace will be made without my directions. So unbeknownst to many of the Native American tribes, particularly 550 of those from the Cheyenne and Aparo tribes, or Apaho tribes, they made their way to one of these peace valleys set up camp there and set up camp there from the end of September until that fateful day in November. And Shivington led his 700 or so troops toward that valley, which the, the chief there of, uh, of the Cheyenne uh, tribe saw and raised an American flag and a white peace flag above their camp. Shivington didn't stop. He proceeded to march and to shoot and to kill and to scalp, and to maim, and to embarrass. Some, some numbers say 150, others say 250. Most of those were elderly, they were women, and they were children. And they would take the, the scalps and, and the body parts, and, and their graphic descriptions, you could read it in history books, and, and find all the, the details if you would like as to what happened. They took, they took these the, the, these, these decorations of war, these trophies in the town. It one suggested that Shivington showed up on one Denver stage with a hundred scalps, bragging about what he had done. And, and for the first few days after the attack, it was heralded as a, a, an aggression against savages, a defense of our country, until details began to come out. There were two congressional hearings that were brought about as a result of that. Eventually, it was determined that this attack was a carefully planned massacre. In fact, someone asked Shivington why he killed so many children in that attack, and his quote was, nits make lice. One of the bleakest days in our nation's history because of the bigotry and the aggression and the godlessness, the actions of those that... that were supposedly in their minds defending our nation. But there was a man. His name was Silas Soule. And history is, is divided on this man's full history and, 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 and whether or not he deserves praise. But on all accounts, in this situation, he decided he, he couldn't participate. In, this. in fact, he ordered his portion of the troops not to fire unless fired upon. He went to commanding officers and, 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 and expressed his displeasure for what was happening. And then when Congress came calling, he testified twice. 
to try to bring justice to what had happened. Actually, no one ever paid any kind of penalty for what happened at Sand Creek. In fact, a couple of years after those testimonies, Silas Soule was killed. Most believe murdered because he had the nerve to choose to stand for justice as opposed to just going along with the crowd. Now, I tell you that story because I believe we're here tonight at the end of this journey through these great sermons and acts with a choice to make. I believe we're here with a, with a decision that, that we have to, 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 to uh, rest on maybe the last time we ever get to make a decision like this. And we've got to choose where, where our faith lies and where our commitment is. Is there a, a worldly crowd we're going to follow or is, a, is there a, a turn against the tide stand that we're going to make and we're going to be who God wants us to be? I believe at the end of every one of these sermons, the sermon in Acts 2, the sermon in, a, in Acts 7, and then the sermon in Acts 17 and now in 26, that's what Paul, that's what Stephen that's what they wanted us to do, right? That's what they wanted us to see. That's how they wanted us to react. Peter's sermon, what are we going to do when presented with the truth of the gospel? Now, I believe we're here about choice, and I'll tell you why I believe that. Let's open our Bibles to our text of Acts 26. Robert did a great job, um, a, a very tiring to me job of, of getting through all of the history, of getting us from when Paul uh, went, went through his, his uh, interactions with the Roman government all the way until that great sermon of Acts chapter 26. He begins in verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things which I'm accused of by the Jews, Paul says, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and the questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now, from that standpoint, he's going to launch into what he does in chapter 22. He's going to give a story. Paul, Paul is a, is a, is a, a modern uh, homiletic master. He has three points. He talks about his place among Judaism. He, he talks about his conversion and then his witness, his life before he got into Christ, how he got into Christ, and what Christ meant to him as a result of that. And in the midst of that sermon that, that we would encourage that you take and read and, and digest, in the midst of that sermon, he's interrupted. Look at verse 24. It says, while Paul was saying this, in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. You're great, the great learning that you've got has, has, is driving you mad. Paul said, I'm not mad, most excellent Festus, but I utter the words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. This hasn't been done in the corner. He's, Listen, you've seen all this. Do you not see a mirror of the life of Christ in the life of Paul here? As, as Jesus goes before Herod, as he's paraded around that night before his crucifixion, and, and everyone wants their shot, everyone wants their interview, there wasn't a single person that Jesus talked to that night that wasn't aware of all that Jesus had done, or at least most of it. Many of them had heard his sermons, they had watched his miracles, they had seen the crowd. It's the exact same thing Paul says with him. I'm talking to you, Agrippa, because you know this. You're among the Jews, and you see this. You're aware of what I've done. You, you've heard my sermons. You've seen these miracles. You're aware of this. And then he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. My, my subject matter tonight is not courage. Nevertheless, that turn in the, ser in the sermon is a courageous moment. You know, it's really easy to stand and preach over, and I don't mean by intellect, because I can't do that, but to preach over people's heads. You know, there, there are some who suggest you're going to preach that you look right above people's heads to the back of the auditorium. So you, you don't read facial expressions, you don't get distracted, you don't get nervous. I don't do that, by the way, but they say do that. But as you're, as you're preaching, and then you just suddenly turn and you say, now Brent, I've got something I want to say to you. Can you imagine that in sermons? In fact, that, that seems like a professor in school that wants to wake somebody up, Right? wants to catch someone's attention. I know some preachers will do that, but they're not doing it the way Paul did it here. Paul said, listen, let me tell you all about my life and all that I've done and all that I've accomplished and all that God's done through me. And as he's interrupted, he turns right back to the one he's appealing to and says, King Agrippa, don't you get what I'm saying? 
Do you believe the prophets or not? Now, he had a grip in a corner. Because I believe somehow Paul knew that Agrippa believed the prophets. And if he believed the prophets, then he should believe Paul. And if he believed Paul, then all this is a sham anyway, and we can go home, and you can become a Christian. And Agrippa's response, which is one of the things I've been assigned tonight, Agrippa replied, reading the New American Standard, in a short time you will persuade me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would wish to God whatever in short or long time, not only you but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am except for these chains. And the king stood up and the governor and Bernice and they said, and those that were sitting with them and when they had gone aside began talking to one another saying, this man has done nothing worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, what in the world does the, the, the choice of Silas Soul have to do with the context of Acts 26 and Agrippa and Paul's freedom? Here it is. I, I've been in a dilemma all week, and, and, and I've been struggling. There were, there were originally three lessons tonight, and as it's been pointed out a couple of times, we're just going to go with two. But I've, I've been given the wonderful task of bringing those two lessons at the end into one. And so the titles were, Are Almost Persuaded and Are You Free? And I, and, I, and I drove all the way from Colorado thinking, how in the world am I going to make these two things match up? And you may leave here thinking, he didn't, okay? That may be your conclusion at the end of all of this. But I think it rests in this. It's all about choice. It's all about making a decision with the, with, with the options in front of you and what's in best interest of God and his kingdom. And I believe that one man in this situation didn't and the other man did, and that's the difference in their lives. Both presented with similar opportunities and advantages and, and resources and, and such, and yet one made the choice for God and one didn't make the choice for God. So, so let's think about those two ideas really, really quickly, and then we'll make some application. The first of those is this almost persuaded concept. You notice I read from the New American Standard, which doesn't read like the King James and the New King James, okay? The King James and the New King James uh, suggest that, that, that Agrippa's response is, you've almost convinced me to become a Christian. They are generally the only two versions that record it that way. In addition to the New American Standard, the ESV says, and Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? The Christian Standard Bible says, then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? Even the old American Standard, the ASV says, but with little persuasion wouldst thou fain make me a Christian? Other, other versions say, with just few words, would you make me a Christian? The, the indication is that this is a defensive response from Agrippa that says, how do you think you're going to come in here and convince me to be a Christian in such a short time, with such a short sermon, with such few words? Now, I think Agrippa was probably a lot closer than he wanted to let on, and a lot more convicted than he wanted to admit, which is why we get the King James, New King James translation of almost. If it wasn't affecting him, he could have just gone on and let Paul talk and then dismissed him. But something struck a chord with Agrippa. And his response was, do you really believe that with all that I would stand to lose for in Christ and in just a short time and with such a short sermon that I would ever obey the gospel? Would you really believe that about me? And Paul's answer is sort of humorous. I would, yes. And not just you, but those people sitting beside you and everybody listening to me, I wish all of you would obey the gospel. This concept is, 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 is real, and we need to flesh that out a little bit more. While it may not be that Agrippa is saying he was close to becoming a Christian, I would suggest to you he should have been. I mean, he heard the same sermon that was heard in Acts 22 and, and that Paul experienced in Acts 9. He had a prior conviction in the word. He believed the prophets. If he wasn't close to becoming a Christian, he should have been close to becoming a Christian. Paul and his, his empathy and, and, his, and his power and, and his emotion and his theology should have brought him. This was a powerful, powerful sermon. It's the type of sermon that has converted good hearts for generations. Agrippa should have been close, but he didn't make the right choice, which is the problem. Now, with that, let's think about the other topic. Let's think about the other thought. 
how does that factor into this question of are we free? And obviously, that's taken, and Robert's mentioned uh, a little bit about it uh, already, but that taken from, from Paul's appeal. You know, if you go back and read in, in, in its fullness those texts that, that we went through earlier in the history of Paul before the Roman government officials, you have his appeal to Caesar in 25, 9 through 11. And if the Bible came with sound effects or background music, you would probably have a dun-dun-dun right after verse 11 when Paul said, I tell you what, I'll appeal to Caesar. And everything changed at that moment. Everything shifted. I want to go to Rome, and I want to appeal to Caesar. I want my day in court. Don't send me back to Jerusalem, and don't dismiss me. I want to be heard based on my citizenship. Now, that's interesting and I'm not going to take the time to do this, but we could. I want you to consider all of the times in the book of Acts that those investigating Paul determined him to be guiltless. Okay? You just write these references down. You can go back and read them. The first is in Acts 16, 35 through 40. That's going to be the, the occasion of the Philippian jailer and, and, and the things that, that fell out in Philippi as a result. And, and Paul and Silas were not guilty of the things that they were put in, in prison for, put in jail for. And it was evident and obvious to those who were around them. Acts 18, verses 12 through 17. In the city of Corinth, the same concept. They're not guilty. They're being persecuted, and people are delivering them up, but they're not guilty. The same thing is said in Acts 23, 29, and in 25, 25. It's no different when you get to our text tonight and you get to the end of it. Listen, Paul's innocent, but guess what? We can't turn him loose, not because we don't want to, and not because he's not deserving of it, because he changed the game. He said, take me to Rome. He said, put me before Caesar. He said, give me my day in court. And while his innocence might set him free, his citizenship and his declaration now makes him bound for Rome. And if we don't know the history of it, and you read chapter 27, you may think Paul dies before he ever gets there. We're not talking about you know, getting on a plane the next morning. And, and, and being guarded by those that, 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 would, that would keep him and moving him along. You're talking about a sea voyage that nearly took his life, if not for God's grace and God's miraculous power, would have taken his life. What does that have to do with choices? Let me share it this way. And there are one or two ways that we could look at it tonight. Paul chose to be in prison when he could have chosen to be free. Why? No, it's not Bible class, and so I really don't expect you to answer, but you could if you wanted to. And here's why. Because Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that I am ready to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. You know how long Paul's been trying to get to Rome? Paul's been trying, trying, and trying. And he, learn, he, learn, he learns at least he figures out or he comes to this conclusion or God helps him understand that the only way he's going to get there is in chains and in prison. So, I want to preach. Do you know how badly Paul wanted to preach to them? When he wrote to them, he said about the Jewish people, particularly maybe the Jewish people in Rome, that if I could trade my salvation for yours, I would do it. Chapter 9, verse 3 of Romans. That's how bad he wanted to go. So Paul chose to be a, an imprisoned man so he could preach to those who were free. On the other hand, Agrippa chose to be free so he didn't have to live by the constraints of a master and a savior. There's the difference. But I want you to flip that. I want you to see it differently. I want you to see tonight that Paul chose freedom from sin and freedom in Christ And Agrippa chose to remain enslaved. That's really the choice that was made. How many times did Paul say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm a prisoner of my master. He didn't consider himself to be custody of the Roman state. En enslaved by Caesar or enslaved by Agrippa or enslaved by Festus or Felix or any of them. He was enslaved by Jesus. He was a free man spiritually. And that's what mattered the most. And Agrippa may have walked away believing he was free not having to answer Paul's question in a corner, backing him down. But he remained enslaved. 
And because we don't know any more about his history, he might have died enslaved, having never obeyed the gospel. Now, all of that, every bit of that, to bring the application down home to us from both of these questions, from both of these concepts tonight. And you could say this is where the sermon starts, but it won't be real long. But this is it. And I was going to do it with the almost persuaded thought first and, and another homiletics lesson. Don't switch streams in, in, in mid, mid-sermon. But we're going, to, we're going to look at the first application, second application first. I'm going to ask you, who, who in your life would you be enslaved to the state for so you could teach them the gospel? It's the one person. It's the one person in your circle of friends, in your family, that you would gladly be shipped to a Roman prison if it meant getting just one chance to preach the gospel to them. I'm not asking hypothetically. I'm asking you to think. And I'm asking you to write that name down on a piece of paper and pray for that person and take the very next opportunity you have to say, I didn't have to go to prison, but I'm going to put our relationship on the line for a moment. I'm going to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know mine. He lives... He lives in Senatobia, Mississippi. <laughs> and he's one of the greatest men I've ever met. But I have already prepared myself to do the funeral of my grandfather who's not a Christian. And if I could go to prison so he can learn the gospel, you could take me away tonight. But here's the cool thing about Paul. Romans 1 says, that Paul was debtor to the Greek, to the barbarian, to the wise, to the unwise. He was ready to preach the gospel to everyone in Rome, and he would go to prison to teach to people he had never even met. You want to talk about the, ch- the power of choice in the heart of a Christian? That's it. I am not here tonight to shame us. This is one of, and I mean this, one of the most evangelistic congregations I've ever been associated with in my time as a Christian. You inspire me, you humble me, you challenge me when we're here. That doesn't mean that we're all that energetic and gung-ho about it. Doesn't mean that that's all our agenda and our purpose. We started this week by talking about the fact that our purpose is the mission of, of, of the saving message of Jesus Christ and everything else pales in comparison. So, who would we go to prison to teach? The beauty of it is I don't have to go to prison. I've got streets full of folks, grocery stores full of folks, and, and, and a contact list full of folks that need the gospel. And I think if we're going to look at the application of Agrippa and the freedom that Paul had to, 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 to preach to him and to those in Rome eventually, we're going to have to ask that question and answer it. Who is the one person? Just, just start with one. One person I'd go to prison to preach to and then go find them and preach to them. Second question of application is this. How close are you to obeying the gospel? I was going to mention this already, but this time last year was a pretty cool evening. Jeremy Pate preached one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my entire life. We sang the invitation song, and Colton came forward and was baptized into Christ. The night I won't forget, at least as long as I'm able to remember most of life, I won't forget that night. And we're not done yet, but let me just say, there's probably someone here tonight similar to where Colton was last year. And maybe you're not callously like Agrippa saying, do you really think, Wayne, with one sermon and pleading in the invitation, you're going to get me to come forward and obey the gospel? And my answer would be, of course I do. That's why I'm doing it. I do. I want you to. 
and love for you. In fact, not just you, but everybody sitting in your row and everybody in your family and everybody that's not a Christian. I would, I would be like Paul in that and say, yes, that's, that's what I want. Maybe it's not becoming a Christian. Maybe it's committing your life as a Christian. We talked a lot about the effects of pandemic and, 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 the, and the fog that we sometimes get in when we're trying to get back on our feet after a, a setback. And, and maybe that setback wasn't COVID for you. Maybe it was a, a loss of a job or, or a struggling marriage or, or a, a transition in, 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 in life. And, and since that point, you just haven't really been committed. You, you've been in the pew and, and, and maybe you've been involved in certain works, but your life just hasn't been exactly what you know it ought to be. And I would ask you, how close are you to saying tonight, listen, I'm not going to let another day go by before I tell the Lord, I'm, I'm back in. I want a part. I want to be here. I want a job. I want a connection. I want fellowship. Where are you tonight in your closeness to Christ and the decision to be all in? I would suggest there are a number of things that might make you make that next step. What word? I mentioned that one of the, one of the ways that, that Scripture is defined and that word is, 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 is translated there in, in, uh, in Agrippa's case when he says almost you persuade me or do you think with so little preaching sometimes it says with so few words okay so what word would it take tonight for you to walk the aisle what's the word maybe it's love maybe it's love Maybe tonight your, your extra push, your, 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 your final commitment, the, the choice is going to be made to, to follow Christ and to give up the freedom that's in the world for the freedom that's in Jesus because, number one, because of who loves you. But I can guarantee you there's a room full of folks that do. And there's a God up in heaven that does, and he wants you to be saved. Or maybe because of who doesn't love you. Satan would love nothing more than you to stay exactly where you are. Even if you're one step away from obeying the gospel, that's one step far enough for him because he doesn't love you, he hates you, and he wants you to die, and he wants you to be lost. Maybe because of the people that you love, the people who've gone on in your family who, who you want to see again. But you know right now in your current state, you wouldn't if you passed away because your life doesn't match even what theirs was, let alone what Christ had had planned for us in his perfect walk. Maybe, maybe the, the word for you isn't love. Maybe the word for you is time. Maybe, maybe we need to be reminded tonight that time is brief. Their life is a vapor. If I really understood that I may not have tomorrow, I may not go to work in the morning, I may not go to school, and not, not because it's going to snow or because you're going to get sick, but because the Lord's going to return and our lives are going to be over and time is brief and time is limited. Maybe, maybe the word time is important because the time is now. You could have a thousand other invitations. But you could also implant a memory in the minds of these folks here that next year this time we'll be talking about again. Because you can't, maybe your word isn't love and, and maybe your word isn't time. Maybe your word is blessing. Maybe the one thing that will get you to walk the aisle is the blessings that are inherently found in Christ that you can't have outside of him. Peace. Ever, ever miss being able to lay your head down at night and rest in peace because of the sin that's in your life and the un, unresolved questions that haven't yet been answered and the commitment that hasn't been made? The blessing of peace is yours if you obey the gospel, if you... Commit your life to him. It, you'll sleep better tonight. I'm convinced of it. Maybe not because of blessings in Christ now, but blessings eternally. Because you want to be with him forever. Or maybe, maybe not blessings now or eternally, but because you want to be a blessing to someone else and be an example for them. Or maybe your word is prayer. You realize that if you're not a Christian tonight, someone's been praying for you. If you're a young person, and, and, and my age definition of young gets older and older every day. Okay? I mean by that now, college students, even preaching students and, and, and teenagers. You know, if you're a young person, somebody's been praying for you to become a Christian since the day you were born or maybe before it. 
your elders have been praying for you and your preacher has been praying for you, would, you, would that word be enough to push you to not let, be, not let you be self, yourself be close, but actually buy in? Maybe not, maybe not the prayer that's been prayed for you by your family, but by the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 for all those who would believe on him through the apostles' teaching. Or maybe because you want to pray. Because you want that line of communication, that, that open dialogue with God, and you want him to hear you when you're struggling, but you know buried in sin that he doesn't and that he can't and that he longs to, and your step, your choice, your decision changes all of that. He's done it all. Listen, I'm either tonight in the shoes of the Apostle Paul and living my freedom in Christ no matter my change, or I'm walking in the shoes of Agrippa saying, I live how I want to live. Friends, the choice is yours. Not in response to this sermon. But in response to Peter's sermon in Acts 2. And Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. And Paul's sermon in Acts 17. Paul's sermon in Acts 26. Do we have a song of invitation tonight announced or planned? Will you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, thank you for creating us in your image and giving us free will and the right to choose. But thank you, Father, for giving us guideposts and landmarks and reminders about what choices are best. Father, we're thankful for the power of preaching and we're thankful for the great book of Acts and for all these sermons and these examples and these individuals who live lives just like we live but have served as examples to us, to us this week of faithfulness and commitment. Father, we pray for the courage to walk in their steps, to seek your face, and to follow your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. The choice is yours. We encourage you to make the right one, and we'd love to help you do that if you'll come while we stand and sing. with a prayer and in that prayer I'll be honest Ronnie I uh, said something I kind of choked on for a second um, you know if the three he th was thankful for the three minutes of rain 
And if that was enough, that God thought that was enough, that was enough. I'll be honest, I choked on it, but um, God provides exactly what we need. This week, he has provided exactly what we need. Robert, he was able to provide exactly what we need. Wayne, brother, he provided exactly what we need. That um, The lessons we received from Sunday through tonight, um, walking through Acts, uh, living as uh, Christians today, seeing um, Peter convict the, um, so many in Jerusalem, uh, seeing Stephen be murdered in Jerusalem, um, seeing Paul go into an unknown land with, with all these unknowns and, and proclaim boldly um, to tonight, seeing Paul go into Roman rule and speak to these men and to have them almost persuaded. The, the sadness of being almost persuaded uh, to the sadness of walking away thinking you're free to the joy of being bound but being free in, in salvation. Um, I'm very thankful. I'm thankful each and every year um, for this week. And each and every year I think I'm going to be we're going to plateau. I'm going to be calloused. Uh, the next year won't be as good. You guys bring it. I mean, I, I'm so thankful for you, for the guys that's gone on. Um, of course, Eric and Hiram, uh, the fantastic jobs of, of being challenged by Eric and just trying to keep up with Hiram. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a challenging week with our time. It's a challenging week uh, with our study and, and, and really uh, – soaking up all that, that these guys have prepared and are, are bringing to us. Um, I'm thankful for it each and every year. Um, the Lord willing, plan on this week, next year. Uh, make your plans now. Um, it's, it's not something to miss. It is something to grow from. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of nights ago, you know, I thought, Wayne, you were a great speaker when you got here. And through these eight years to see you evolve um, to become what you are today and deliver the message you deliver tonight. I feel blessed to be able to watch that and, and see that and sit at your feet. Um, I'm thankful for that, and I, I know everyone here is too. Um, I don't know what else to say. Da David, we'll be, Dastin, we'll be, he'll be leading us in a closing prayer. Um, but keep that in mind for next year. Um, you can come on up, David. You can keep that in mind for next year. Uh, that will be this time, and, and uh, thank you each and every one of you for being here this week. You can go ahead and be standing now as we're led in our closing prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know we, we truly are such a blessed people, Father, and we're so grateful for, for each and every day you give us, Father, but we're, we're so thankful for these last few days we've had together as, as brothers and sisters and as a church family here, Father. These lessons that they just, they strengthen our faith so much, Father. They lift us up and, and, and we hope we take all these, all, all, all these lessons from these good men with us out into the world with us each day. We have so many people to be thankful for, Father. We thank you for these these good men that brought these just wonderful lessons to us. We thank you for Wayne and Robert. Thank you for Eric and Hiram and Dan. Just just their their wisdom and their just their the gift they have of just bringing your word to all of us and just keeping us excited, keeping us just lifted up and and just wanting to learn more of your word, Father, and and, and live our lives more for you each day. We're so thankful for their families and, and the, just being willing to travel here from different states, different cities, Father, and be here with us. And we hope that we did all we could as a church family to, to make them feel at home, to make them feel welcome while they were here. We're, we're thankful for the, for the students from, from Bear Valley and just we hope, Father, they realize the, the hope and the enthusiasm we see and we gain through them when, when they're here with us. We, we thank you so much. There's so many people involved in, in putting this together, Father, and it's, it's such a blessing for all of us. We thank you for the elders and their wisdom and their, their love for us and, and, and being able to see, see something we all need in our hearts and in our souls and, and to, to have that word brought to us. We thank you for the men that, that, that organized this, and, and we thank you for all the people involved in, in every step of it, Father, from 
preparing food and meals to open in their homes and their hearts to these people. And, 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 and thank you, Father, for the visitors we had from, from different places and, and just some old friends, new friends. We hope in the end that they all felt like they were a part of our family here and that, that they felt at home here and, and were lifted up by these messages. As we, we get ready to leave tonight, Father, just let us remember to take these words with us, to, to be bold and be brave out in this world, to, to, to always try to be a light and to, to, to not be afraid to, to profess your word to others, Father, to, to, to try to teach those that, that want to learn and, and just to always be open to, to, a, to a conversation with someone to try to, to, to bring them closer to you and your son. Once again, we know we truly are blessed. We, we thank you for each, each and every day you give us, Father, and, and we, we couldn't ask for more as a church family than we've had over these last few days. We want to thank you most of all, as always, for your son, for, for his life, and ultimately for his death, the, the sacrifice he gave for each and every one of us that, that plays such an important part of what we have learned over these last few days. And just let us always remember that just to always go out and be lights, live our lives for him, to, to walk for him in everything we do. We, we hope we live lives that lift you up and make you proud of us always as your children, Father. We ask you to go with us, not just now, but always, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.